Hello and welcome to our Wednesday meditations here at Grace Lutheran Church in Mendham, New Jersey. I'm Pastor Tim Wengert, the vice pastor here until March 1st when Pastor Julie Haspel uh, will uh, take the reins, so to speak, uh, as the full-time pastor here. Um, we've been talking about some difficult issues in Martin Luther's thought, and we began with the question of obedience to government and revolution uh, last week, and I want to continue that again this week and talk a little bit about the relationship between a Christian and the government. Um, and begin with a reminiscence uh, from my childhood of one of the books that was on my parents' bookshelf, uh, which they read and reacted to uh, by William Shirer, which was The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, where Shirer, along with other scholars before him, argued that you could draw a direct line from Luther to Frederick the Great to Bismarck to Hitler. Um, and the idea was that Luther taught a kind of passivity when it came to governmental affairs, uh, rather like the, the, that uh, little uh, ditty, uh, my, my father drunk and, so, uh, and sober, my, uh, or sober my father, uh, my country, right or wrong, my country. Um, and Shirer was wrong. Luther really didn't preach that kind of passivity when it came to government and just accepting uh, whatever the government did as, as being right. Um, that just simply isn't true, although it did reflect a kind of mentality that developed in the 19th and 20th century among Lutherans in Germany uh, and others as well. Uh, the notion that nationality, uh, nationalism actually, was a kind of a of a calling of the Christian, uh, which was very popular in the late 19th, early 20th century, among some, but not certainly all, uh, Lutheran theologians. Um, well, if Shirer was wrong, what is it that Lutherans really believe when it comes uh, to government? There, we turn not to Martin Luther so much as to the Augsburg Confession, the central confession of Lutherans around the world and the 16th article deals with public order and secular government. The first thing it says might sound like, well, yes, we should obey no matter what. Concerning public order and secular government, it's taught that all political authority, orderly government, laws, and good order in the world are created and instituted by God, and that Christians may without sin exercise political authority, be princes and judge, pass sentences and administer justice, according to imperial or other existing laws, punish evildoers with the sword, that is, with the coercion, um, wage just war, serve as soldiers, buy and sell, take required oaths, possess property, be married, etc. Now, actually, the aim there was against certain monastic uh, theology that said the Christian's real job was to try to withdraw from the world. Uh, and also uh, from uh, groups among the Anabaptist communities that rejected certain aspects of, uh, of this uh, list here of things that Christians can do. But some people later on surely took this to mean that Christians are supposed to simply uh, accept the, uh, um, the government. They then go on with condemnations in this article, uh, including then an attack on uh, on monastic uh, understanding of the 15th, 16th century. In fact, the only true perfection, they add, is true fear of God and true faith in God. For the gospel teaches an internal, eternal reality and righteousness of the heart, not an external, temporal one. The gospel does not overthrow secular government, public order, and marriage but instead intends that a person keep all this as a true order of God and demonstrate in these walks of life Christian love and true works. Up until then, it sounds like, yep, we're supposed to salute and do whatever the government says. <coughs> Excuse me. Christians, therefore, they conclude, are obliged to, to be subject to political authorities and to obey its commands and laws. And now comes the hook in all 
that may be done without sin. But if the command of a political authority cannot be followed without sin, one must obey God rather than any human being, as it says in Acts 5, verse 29. There's the hook. The Augsburg Confession was presented to the emperor, and it was actually a defense of uh, resistance, passive resistance to the government on the question of religion itself. There were limits, and that's what the Augsburg Confession says, even though later folks didn't always agree with them. The same is true in some of the things that Martin Luther himself uh, said and wrote. And the most important point is to understand the distinction between what the church is and what government is. Now, in those days, it was the city councils that called pastors. And there was a city council in Kreuzburg that didn't like their pastor and tried to get rid of him. When Luther heard that the only reason they were getting rid of him is that they didn't like his sermons because they attacked some of the people in the town uh, personally, he wrote this to them, a letter, which really smokes. Some time ago, I wrote uh, to you uh, and requested you to be good enough to let your parson go, because Luther thought they were right, that this guy was incompetent. For I under as I understood the situation, he was a failure and had been dismissed by the visitors, that is to say, the, the uh, people from uh, uh, the church who were seeing if he was doing a good job. Now, I am informed by the visitors that he has not been a failure and that they had neither dismissed him nor intended to do so. On the contrary, they testify to the purity of his teaching and irreproachable character of his life. But they also report that you have harbored a grudge against him because he rebuked vices on which account you intended to drive him out. I gather from all of this that the devil desires to start trouble and cause you great harm. Wherefore, I am moved to write this letter to you with the very friendly request, oh no, it's a little more than friendly, that you receive it as I intend in your best interests. And he goes after them. And there's that distinction. Yes, he doesn't mind. It has to be secular people, even though it may be a congregational council or something that uh, can, can ask a pastor to leave. Uh, that's true. But if you do it for the wrong reasons, and if you are attacking that person's call, then all bets are off. Despite being the government, Luther reamed, the lights, into, lights, lights into them uh, and says, you may not do this. That's a distinction. Luther feared two things, you see. Princes ruling the church and telling them what to do, or pastors, like the pope, trying to rule the world and telling the world what to do. No, there was a distinction. And the line of distinction is the law of God. And either way, you have people violating that law, and that makes all the difference. So, yes, Luther probably emphasized obedience more than, than, uh, than he should have, and certainly people misunderstood him. But nevertheless, Luther clearly was engaged in politics and uh, very often spoke out on the social issues and other issues of the day. A verse from hymn number 700, uh, uh, 713. O God of every nation, of every race and land. Redeem your whole creation with your almighty hand. Where hate and fear divide us and bitter threats are hurled, in love and mercy guide us and heal our strife-torn world. Keep bright in us the vision of days when war shall cease, when hatred and division give way to love and peace, till dawns the morning glorious when truth and love shall reign, and Christ shall rule victorious o'er all the world's domain. Amen. That hymn was written by William Reed, who was a medic during World War II and really reflects upon 
the human desire for peace. Thank you very much.